everyone, this is Sam Black with another edition of Drafting Archetypes. This week I will be talking about blue-white in Kaldheim. And often I say, like, you know, red-white aggro or, uh, you know, some kind of further description of what the archetype is. But with blue-white I'm going to be talking about a couple significantly different directions. I don't think there's like a single way to draft blue-white and I'm going to try to cover all of it. So just kind of blue-white generally. But before I get into that, I'd like to start off by thanking the new patrons to the show. Dennis, Kurt, Cody, David, Robert, Itmar, Scott, Matthias, Maxwell, and Douglas. Thank you very much, everyone, for your support. It really means a lot to me. And if anyone else listening is interested in becoming a patron or checking out the benefits and stuff like that, supporting the show, whatever, head over to patreon.com slash drafting archetypes to get to vote. Benefits include uh, voting on the topic that I cover each week and access to the spreadsheets that I make to process all the information and then condense it into the actual podcast, logs to my drafts, stuff like that. So if any of that appeals to you, check that out. And now let's get into blue-white. I guess as usual, my starting point is what gets you into blue-white. And I think I want to start by saying that I think that blue-white is somewhat niche or not necessarily like... I think there are not that many paths into blue-white, or the paths into blue-white aren't necessarily that common. So, um, like, let's let's start by looking at the premium uncommons, because they come up more often. And so these are cards that, like, I would be considering uh, as a first pick possibility when I open a pack, that from there might lead me into blue-white. So those would be Vega the Watcher, which is uh, the blue-white uncommon, one and a blue for a 2-2 flyer. When you cast a foretell, foretold card, you draw a card. Clarion Spirit, this is the one and a white 2-2. When you cast your second spell, make a 1-1 one, one flyer. Shepherd of the Cosmos is the uh, four and white, white, 3-3 three, three flying angel with foretell for three and a white. And when it enters the battlefield, you can return a permanent with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. Giant's Amulet is the single blue equipment. When it enters the battlefield, you can spend three and a blue to make a 4-4 giant, and the equipment gives plus 0, plus 1, and hexproof while the creature is untapped. Valkyrie's Sword, this is one and a white equipment, gives plus 2, plus 1, and when it enters the battlefield, you can spend four and a white to make a 4-4 Flying Vigilance Angel, Avalanche Collar, one in a blue for a 1-3 snow wizard, probably a human or something, and you can spend two mana to turn a snow card land into a 4-4 hexproof creature until end of turn with haste. Usher of the Fallen is the white 2-1 spirit warrior that you can boast for one in a white to make a 1-1. And then Rune Crown is the equipment that costs three, and when it enters the battlefield, you can search your hand graveyard library for a rune, equip it to and equip it to rune crown, and then rune crown gives plus one plus one for two to equip. Icebind pillar, two and a blue artifact, snow tap, tap target creature artifact, and glimpse the cosmos is one and a blue sorcery, look at the top three cards, put one in your hand, put the others on the bottom, and then you can cast it from your graveyard for a single blue if you control a giant. So those are like the powerful uncommons and I think some of those are more likely to put you into blue-white than others. For example, I think Usher of the Fallen is like a strong white card. I'm not looking to first pick it. I don't think it's particularly exceptional. From Usher of the Fallen, maybe I'd end up in blue-white. But uh, honestly, Usher of the Fallen plays better in most, if not all, other white archetypes. Whereas something like Vega is obviously going to specifically point you to blue-white. And something like Clarion Spirit is totally open, great in any deck, but maybe maybe there's some specific extra value to it in blue-white because it plays well with blue cantrips and card drawing and stuff. I'll kind of get more into like how each of these uncommons fit into the different archetypes and how they like 
push you to those in a little bit. But th those are the primary like uncommons that I see first picking that just open me up to being blue white. Um, and then uh, as far as cards that specifically put me in blue white, so I think there, are, let's step back a second and move into the next point, which is uh, that there are really two core varieties of uh, blue white as I see it. There's uh, like Sky's aggro, and then there's like control. For the most part, you end up in Sky's aggro because you start probably drafting a white aggro deck, and then maybe you find particular access to gold vein pick, which is the two to equip plus one plus one, or two to play, one to equip, uh, plus one plus one equipment, where when the equipped creature damages a player, you make a treasure. If you have like, if you find those coming and you end up with multiples of them, you might want to particularly prioritize flyers. So you might find that blue is the best way to like pick up those extra flyers that can hold the pick to re reliably connect. And once you have multiple flyers that are reliably connecting with multiple picks, you might say, oh, I'm going to end up with a bunch of treasures. Now I'm going to have a bunch of extra mana. Now maybe I want some expensive spells. Valkyrie's Sword is a standout, really exceptional card for filling that role that I can use to take advantage of this treasure that I'm getting in addition to just like being able to use it just for like a little bit of a mana bump or extra damage or something. I think basically the aggro deck is going to be largely based in white with blue support, though a lot of the blue support cards are really good high pick cards that you might take just like before you know where you are and then maybe white aggro ends up open. So cards like any of the blue flying creatures, uh, Mistwalker, Augury Raven, and Bergstrider that are just kind of like general use good blue commons. If you have those and then white aggro's like open, you can easily use those cards really well with the white aggressive cards and pivot into that deck. Whereas with the control deck, I think that blue and white offer really, really good control tools in a vacuum in this format. You have access to good card draw in Behold the Multiverse. You have access to some like kind of less power. Like so strategic planning has some selection and synergies that can kind of end up amounting to card advantage if you kind of work for it a little bit. You have good blockers, good evasive threats. You have some more further filtering and pilfering hawk. A lot of the uncommons offer a source of card advantage. Like the fundamentals, you have a lot of, um, you have abundant access to efficient sheep removal, which is actually kind of something rare for blue white to have. But between bind the monster, which is the single blue enchant creature that taps the creature and it doesn't untap it, you take damage equal to its power when you play it, and iron verdict, which is uh, the white instant that foretells for a single white or hard casts for two and a white to do five damage to a tapped creature or raven form which is the blue sorcery i think two and a blue foretells for a single blue that exiles a non-land permanent and gives its controller a one-one flying bird all of those cards are not widely desirable but play particularly well in blue white control bind the monster has the disadvantage that it's hurting you, but you, it, you can use white cards to like offset that damage that you're taking and like gain life and be able to continue to use additional bind the monsters or whatever. Iron Verdict is a really strong removal spell, but only if your opponent's creatures are becoming tapped, usually because they're attacking you, or but maybe because you have an ice bind pillar or something. Raven Form is a very hard removal spell, like it will actually answer things, it's very flexible, but giving your opponent a 1 1 flyer is significantly problematic for a lot of decks but with blue white you might have a lot of your own flyers you might be able to like invalidate that one one flyer it might not be a problem for you so there's like all this access to like late pick cheap efficient removal to support your uh behold the multiverse based card advantage your vega that's giving you card advantage all that stuff and so it feels like oh this there's the tools are here for a really strong control deck the issue is that in practice, the mid-range decks in this format, specifically the five color snow decks, are so strong that your low impact one-for-ones backed by a couple of card draw spells 
aren't really going to get it done because your opponents also have the same access to those card draw spells and are also prioritizing them and they also get a bunch of like green card advantage on top of that and so i believe that in order to compete with like the multi the strength of the multicolored decks because like they get so much extra strength for the fact that they can just take any card that they see you really need to be playing towards some specific really powerful rare this is kind of the traditional like to play control in limited you need a bomb that you're playing for that's kind of true in a lot of formats and contexts um and so the the number of cards that can fill that role i think is very very small i think vega can potentially do it but vega is really fragile so i think vega is contributing to that thing but not sufficient by itself to be like oh well i can just draft a control deck and i'll have enough ability what you're really looking for is a really strong late game rare or mythic card that can either offer enough card advantage that you think you can actually power through the mid-range decks or take over the game in some capacity. And I'm not saying any of these by themselves are necessarily sufficient, but the kinds of cards that are going to get me thinking, oh, maybe I can actually like profitably draft blue light control, are cards like, these are going to be rares and mythics, Cosima, God of the Voyage, I'm not going to read it, look it up. Cosmos Elixir, which is the four mana artifact, at the end of your turn you gain two life, if you're at 20 instead of gaining uh, two life you draw a card, 20 or more. Maskwood Nexus, which is the four mana artifact that makes all of your creatures all creature types, regardless of where they are, and you can spend three and tap it to make a 2-2 changeling. Doomscar, which is the five mana kill all creatures that foretells for one and two white. It's three and two white to cast from your hand. Nico Eris, the Planeswalker. It does some things. It's a Planeswalker. It ultimately basically just draws you cards. It's relatively weak for a Planeswalker, but a Planeswalker is exactly what this kind of deck is looking for. Sternheim Unleashed. This is the ridiculous card that makes a million angels and wins the game very easily. And Allrund, God of the Cosmos, is another double-faced card that I'm not going to read all of, but is fairly strong. If you don't have some kind of, like, legitimate game-winning bomb like that, I think if you're, like, finding yourself in blue-white, you do want to prioritize flyers and trying to end a game. The, the blue and white cards are really well positioned to kind of, like, blocking, answering threats, grinding for a while, but like you need to have some reason to believe that you're going to actually be able to beat strong decks in a long game, and without a rare, you're just not reliably going to be able to do that. So you're better off maybe taking some small parts, some small synergies that work in a control deck, and at least like melding that with some of the aggro deck, or just fully leaning into the like aggro deck. So those are kind of the two like different approaches that exist that you're going to approach like philosophically from different places and some of the key cards that you're going to look for so as for the skies deck let's talk about the details here the creatures that you're going to prioritize are obviously just all the common flyers as far as the commons go so that's battlefield raptor the one in a white one two flying first strike white creature. Mistwalker, the two and a blue, one four flying changeling. You can spend one and a blue to give it plus one minus one until end of turn. Starnaheim Courser, two and a white, two two flyer, makes your artifacts, I, yeah, artifacts, and, or maybe just equipment and enchantments. Some things cheaper to cast by one. Augury Raven is three and a blue for a three three flyer that foretells for one and a blue. And Stalwart Valkyrie is a 3-2 flyer for 3 and a white that you can cast for 1 and a white by exiling a creature in your graveyard. Um, I have not yet listed Pilfering Hawk because I think it's a tier below those others, but does still carry a piece of equipment, has like a reasonable rate, lets you connect with Goldman Pick on the earliest possible turn, and the looting can potentially do something for you. Uh, Pilfering Hawk is another card that you want for this deck as a flyer, but below all of those other flyers. And then the last creature that I'm really, really excited about in this archetype is Bergstrider. Bergstrider has justifiably been getting a lot of press recently because 17lands.com, a website that players can use to track their arena drafts and results and everything that compiles the results and breaks it down into a bunch of like interesting statistics about 
use of cards and how they're drawn and stuff, and then their win percentages. Bergstrider has some really impressive stats on that page. So people have been making the case that it's among the top, maybe even the top blue common. And I think that Bergstrider, so once we acknowledge, oh, Berg, Bergstrider is a card that has been somewhat overlooked or at least not given quite due respect, you want to make sure that you understand what its role is and where it's best and how to use it. And I would argue that Bergstrider is actually in its absolute best in Sky's Aggro. And the reason for that is that when you have a bunch of ground creatures, sometimes tapping a single blocker isn't enough to enable an attack. I recently had a Giants deck where my opponent had like a creature and I had a bunch of creatures and my plan was to play Bergstrider, tap their blocker, and hit them for a ton of damage. But then on their turn, they played Giant's Amulet, and now they had a 4-5 that I couldn't tap with my Bergstrider. And now my Bergstrider wasn't able to generate any meaningful tempo, tempo at all. Whereas, if you're a flyer deck, it's much more likely that your opponent is going to have like only one creature that can block your flyers, and locking that down will let you get, a, get in a bunch of damage. And then the Bergstrider, 4-4 four, four in this form, part of why Bergstrider is so good is that 4-4 four, four is very, very large in this format. Very few creatures can attack through that profitably. And so the Bergstrider both uh, disables your opponent's blocker and holds the ground by itself and gives you this big tempo swing in an archetype that historically very, very much has to race. Because what happens when you cast a flying creature is that you pay something in terms of the like raw stats, the power of those creatures, for evasion. Which means against another aggro deck that's playing creatures that don't have evasion, their creatures are going to hit harder. So if you're hitting them and they're hitting you, because you're taking advantage of your evasion, but because you're taking advantage of your, of your evasion, your creatures are tapped so they can't really block, and your creatures are smaller than theirs anyway, so blocking isn't really much of a thing, you end up in this spot where you're racing, but you're behind against an aggressive deck because their creatures are bigger. But the advantage that you get due to having evasion is that you you have much greater control of the tempo of the game. You can at any point choose to leave a creature back and chump block it with it or invalidate their smaller creatures, whereas they don't have a choice. If your creatures have flying, all they can do is attack you with their creatures and hope to win the race. Bergstrider is perfect for kind of like flipping that race and invalidating their aggressive plan and making sure that like your creatures are able to win the race. So surprisingly, perhaps this non-flying creature is kind of the perfect top end in your deck full of flying creatures. The fact that Bergstrider is good has this implication that, oh, well, if I'm trying to draft around Bergstrider and trying to make that work, now I need to spend picks on Snowlands because you really want your Bergstrider to lock a creature down rather than just tapping a blocker. And we see this reflected somewhat in the stats on Bergstrider, where Bergstrider, as I mentioned, has really exceptional numbers in terms of like its win rate when it's drawn and everything, but it actually has slightly below average or unimpressive impact on the win rate of decks that include it overall. And that's presumably because of the sacrifice they need to make in drafting to end up with Bergstrider is, well, if you have to prioritize these lands, the rest of your deck is a little bit weaker, and now you need to draw your payoff to justify these picks that you're making. That's particularly true in blue-white, where you don't get a lot of other utility out of the snow lands you're taking, because white really doesn't care about the snow. So you want to, you really do want to use Bergstrider in these aggressive decks, but I would caution to be careful about how highly you're prioritizing Bergstrider, especially in the control decks, where you might decide that it's better to avoid prioritizing Snowlands at all and skip Bergstrider entirely, especially because in the control decks, Bergstrider's whole deal, this tempo thing, is fundamentally exactly what your deck is not about. Everything about the way that Blue White is positioned, it's designed to not care about tempo. It's all about like attrition and card advantage and not about tempo. All your removal is super cheap. You're going to be able to deploy it. You have like cards like Giant Ox if you want it that basically functions as additional removal that's very cheap. It, like, it's very good at holding off 
creatures that cost more mana than it if you don't care about your ability to attack on the ground. Bergstriders, you know, long story short, fantastic in blue-white aggro. I don't think it's worth working for in blue-white control. And you need to, if you're somewhere in the middle, you need to figure out where you are on that spectrum and also how cheaply you can get your snowlands and maybe hold off on Bergstrider until you have a reason to believe that you can at least get some snowlands cheaply, which good news is snow plains are the cheapest snowland to get. They um, are the most likely snowland to come around late in the pack because snow, white has the least use for snow. So you might be able to enable some cheap, cheap as far as what it costs, cheap opportunity cost Bergstriders by f picking up some snow plains if you keep an eye out for that. Talked about how gold vein picks particularly useful how if you have multiple gold vein picks in your skies deck you're going to be uh, really well positioned to be able to count on those treasures and you can use the fact that you can count on those treasures in a number of ways but basically you want to count on them you want to prepare yourself to take advantage of the additional access to mana that those imply so ways that you can do that obviously Cards like Valkyrie's Sword, Giant's Amulet, Run Ashore, any kind of expensive high-impact cards. But another great one to look for is off-color lands that have activated abilities. And I mean off-color not as in necessarily like I want to put this land that taps for green in my deck, but I have played like a blue-white deck, or maybe it was green-white, but the point stands, that had... Uh, multiple picks and I played um, the armory, the red white land that can search, well the white the land that taps for white and you can spend two red and a white and one and sacrifice it to search your library for an aura and an equipment I didn't play any mountains in my deck I had no way to generate red mana other than the treasures, but with three picks and a bunch of evasive creatures I thought it was likely enough that I would have treasure lying around that I'd be able to take advantage of this land often enough to offset the drawback of it entering the battlefield tapped. And so you actually get like extra access to these like sacrifice for value lands if you have gold vein picks that you can count on to like give you the mana to access them. That only works if you have like multiple gold vein picks, but if you do, you might want to think about like picking up a Lichara Mirror Lake, which is the land that activates for um, blue and green mana to clone something, put a plus one plus one counter on it. You might want to think about including cards like that in a blue-white deck. That covers gold vein pick, priority creatures. There are some non-flyers that are reasonable to play in this deck. Mostly you'd be looking for like two mana creatures that are going to help you in those racing spots that I was talking about against aggro decks, or that can hold your equipment well if you don't draw an early flyer, like for uh, Besker Shield Mate and Story Seeker, that's the one in a white 2 1 creature that when it dies, you get a 1 1 creature, and the um, one in a white 2 2 lifelink creature. Both of those are very good, cheap creatures to put a gold vein pick on on turn three and attack to try to get a treasure while getting a reasonable creature that can, you know, battle for a while and profitably trade or something. Totally fine support card for this deck. Lower priority than all the flyers, but definitely like a functional card to put in your deck. You can also go up the curve with some of the other like bigger not flying white creatures that you know function in aggressive decks but they're not going to be priorities because you don't want to like you don't want your creatures to be purely defensive and you don't want to have to like worry a lot about like tangling on the ground and stuff god's hall guardian i think is probably the best of those since it can kind of do the bergstrider job of like doing disproportionately high amount of work against ground-based aggro decks but uh, for the most part, you know, I would hope to count on Bergstrider and my cheap removal spells for that role. One thing I want to mention about Skies is there are really a relatively small, not a tiny, but a relatively small number of like premium commons that you're trying to build your deck around, and then a bunch of cards in your colors that you don't want to play. Like, like I said, you don't want to play, like, white has a lot of like random non-flying creatures that cost three or more mana and you don't really don't want to play any of them and that means that just and there are also just like a fairly large number of just like objectively bad or really narrow white cards that you don't want to play uh like 
invoke the divine and the plus one plus one aura and in all but the like most flyer heavy skies decks warhorn blast and stuff there are a bunch of just like really kind of like narrow underperforming cards not really in the market for cards like revitalize and stuff so the number of commons you're looking for is relatively narrow so that means like it means that there's not a lot of replacement repl like the cards you're looking for aren't really replaceable you need like exactly this common plus this common plus this common the good news is you are prioritizing them a lot higher than most other people in theory and in theory you're in a relatively unpopular archetype so you should be able to get this stuff in practice unfortunately a lot of the cards that you want most are cards that are kind of disproportionately prioritized by drafters in general literally just because they're overrated like people think augury raven is better than it is when really it's like specifically good in blue white and then like playable in other places it was like miscategorized like a top blue common for a while and i think a lot of people still have that perception and so you might end up in a frustrating spot where like if everyone knew what they were doing there are cards that should like table back to you but that's not what ends up happening. And I mean, obviously you can have a debate about how much this should happen or whatever, but like another another example is Arilax tweeted recently about how he thinks Iron Verdict is taken more aggressively than it should be, which, you know, may or may not be true depending on how people are trying to use it and everything, but it is way better in blue-white than it is in any other archetype because either you're playing just like full control and obviously your opponent has to attack you or you're playing skies aggro and your opponent's going to be attacking you on the ground because they need to race in either spot a removal spell that only targets tapped creatures is going to perform relatively well whereas because white generally wants to be aggressive a lot of the other archetypes you're really looking for removal that's specifically going to remove a blocker which iron verdict doesn't do so if it's correct or if it's true that people are really overrating Iron Verdict, that has the it has poor consequences for people who are trying to draft blue white, who should be receiving Iron Verdict as a reward for putting themselves in blue white. I feel very similarly about Bind the Monster. Um, I'm Bind the Monster is the kind of card that I personally typically one could say underrate or one could say correctly value lower than other people so i don't have a lot of experience casting by the monster is what i'm getting at in principle it makes a lot of sense to me that it would be really good in blue white control uh it pairs really well with cards like doomscar oracle which pair well with revitalize which contributes to this like answer your stuff and gain life plan that makes a lot of sense to me in this control deck you also get like some weird synergies, like I'm gonna play strategic planning with a bunch of cards like Bind the Monsters or Bind the Monster and Bound in Gold, maybe even the Lajara minus three minus O thing that I would really personally hope not to play. Bunch of that stuff with strategic planning. Now I'm often going to just like end up with some of these negative auras in my graveyard and I can play Master Scald and I'm also gonna end up with some creatures in my graveyard and now I can turn my Master Scald into a reasonable body that's going to reliably draw a card maybe a removal spell all of that is like stuff you can build around to really take advantage of buying the monster and then also you care a lot that it's a cheap removal spell to pair with your card draw because um, obviously what you need when you're drawing more cards is the ability to use those cards very like cheaply and quickly to trade with your opponent's cards to maximize what you're getting out of your card advantage to make sure that you're not just clogging your hand in a way that's in effect possible that buying the monster is also good as a tempo play in blue white aggro but the fact that it damages you makes it not necessarily quite that strong in an archetype that's going to be racing a lot so uh, a, a bit of caution but possible applications to using buying the monster in like blue white skies other cards to discuss uh, specifically. Depart the Realm, kind of generic bounce spell that's fine. Generic bounce spells are pretty good in tempo decks. So another card that can very reasonably find a home here. Also, if you have any kind of like foretell synergies, you get to benefit there. And then 
Run Ashore is another card that gets the Bergstrier award for exceptional stats according to 17 lands that was kind of like widely disregarded or underrespected that has uh, seemed from the data that's compiled to perform pretty well when people actually put it in their decks and cast it. Just like with Disdainful Stroke, it has some additional utility, or it's well suited to decks that are racing a lot. And it's also, I mean, Run with Run Ashore in general, it's worth noting, it plays really well with any kind of like strong enter the battlefield value. For example, Giant's Amulet, where you can pick up your Giant's Amulet and cast it again to get another Giant, and you're essentially getting a one-for-one -one trade with your opponent where you put a card on top of their library and they have to draw it again, and you spent a card to do that, except you're also basically drawing another 4-4. Four -four. And then you can also use Run Ashore when your Saga's, when the trigger for your Saga's third chapter is on the stack to return your Saga to your hand, do it all over again. Run Ashore, good card, plays well in blue-eyed aggro because of its tempo elements, plays well specifically with gold vein pick because it's an expensive thing to spend treasures on that's relatively high impact. Last common I want to call out specifically in blue-eyed aggro is Disdainful Stroke, also great in blue-eyed control. The reason I like it in aggro is these treasures that I am implying that I have because I am prioritizing gold vein pick and likely only prioritizing flyers and ending up with this archetype in the first place. If I think that I'm like getting gold, like I, I can't, gold vein pick is kind of like one of the primary cards that's getting me into this archetype, so I'm imagining that I have them. Anyway, those treasures make it a lot easier to hold up Disdainful Stroke in the mid game. And then Disdainful Stroke is super premium in the control deck because you need to be able to answer your opponent's really high impact stuff when you're planning to just like play a really long game where you answer all your opponent's stuff. Sometimes that stuff, rather than being a creature that you can iron verdict, it's like uh, waking the trolls or like some really high impact saga or sorcery or whatever. And yeah, the, the control deck really wants some counter spells. Not surprising, very typical of control decks. But Disdainful Stroke's the only common one, I believe, unless I'm forgetting some really... Oh, an all. Yeah, the, there's another one, but I don't, I don't want to make deck an all. So those are kind of the, like, standout uh, commons for me in the aggro deck. Oh, so I, I talked about, like, the premium on commons broadly, and then I didn't talk about a few... Uh, what I've listed is archetype specific uncommons. These are cards that I'm not looking to first pick. They're not premium uncommons. They're more, you know, if you use, if you subscribe to the like rewards versus the reasons versus rewards distinction in talking about cards and limited, these would be the rewards. They're not the things that get you into the archetype, but they're benefits or cards that only you can use that make your deck stronger and you want to be particularly aware of them when you're drafting because they might inform something about like your deck and how you're drafting and everything. And so like those archetype specific reward uncommons are New Catify's Destiny. That's the saga that gains life for each year for told cards and then gives you mana for it for told card and then returns a saga from your graveyard, or not a saga, a for told card from your graveyard to your hand. Gates of Isfel is the land that enters the battlefield tap, taps for a white, and then you can spend a bunch of mana, tap, sack it, and draw two cards and gain two life and Colossal Plow. Colossal Plow is the two mana vehicle with crew six that becomes a six three creature and when it attacks you gain three life and add three white mana that doesn't empty your mana pool until the end of the turn. So the two that require both blue and white mana it's pretty obvious why these are archetype specific. Um, Colossal Plow, the reason that I think of it as a blue white card is that I believe that blue white is by far the best deck at playing Giant Ox, and you only really want Colossal Plow if you're also willing to put Giant Ox in your deck, and I think it's only worth including the Colossal Plow Giant Ox combo if your Giant Ox isn't going to be embarrassing if you draw it without the Colossal Plow. Also, you would probably like it if your Colossal Plow isn't embarrassing if you don't draw Giant Ox, which means Colossal Plow has some further implications about how you draft your deck. Specifically, if you have a Colossal Plow, obviously the biggest thing is you're going to prioritize Giant Ox. The fact that you're going to prioritize Giant Ox means you would like to be a deck that can use Giant Ox well, and you would also like, well, to use Giant Ox well, one might also consider, <laughs> fans of Giant Ox also liked Raider's Carve. 
This is another vehicle that allows you to crew something meaningful with your giant ox. This is the uh, three mana four four with crew three. When it attacks, you can look at the top card of your library. If it's a land, you can put it onto the battlefield. Carve is an okay card if you if most of your creatures have three power rather than two power, so that you can reliably crew it with a single creature. Therefore, if I'm prioritizing giant ox, because I'm prioritizing colossal plow, now I'm thinking about raiders carve. Now I'm thinking about three power creatures. While I'm thinking about three power creatures, I'm processing, hey, two three power creatures is enough to crew a colossal plow if I don't draw my giant ox. That's convenient. That's all the more reason to look for three power creatures specifically. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, if I'm drafting like a colossal plow version of blue white, I want to assign a little bit more weight to creatures that happen to have three power. So that means that a card like Doomscar Oracle is going to be a pretty good fit compared to other three mana creatures that maybe don't have three power. Uh, this might be a reason that one might so go, go so far as to play the 3-2 that uh, looks at the top card of a player's library and can put it in the graveyard over maybe something like the 2-3 Boast Tapper or something. If you're going down the Plow Ox path, think specifically about prioritizing three power creatures, both to take advantage of Carve and to be able to combine two creatures to crew a Plow. Also, maybe don't bother putting Plow in your deck unless you have like at least two Plows and three Oxes or something around that kind of area. If you're me, I mean, if I were to advise you to draft the way that I would draft, I would say just avoid the whole mess altogether. But I know that there are players who've had success with Plow and it can work, so it seems worth discussing. As for a specific um, consideration regarding Nico Defies Destiny, obviously this card's only good if you have like a lot of other Fertel cards. For the most part, I'm only really interested in playing it if I have some premium Fertel cards, or at least like a good number of above average Fertel cards, um, or at least if my Fertel cards are cards that I expect to reliably end up in the graveyard, i.e. not God's Hall Guardian, for example, which is just going to hang out on the battlefield and not let me take advantage of the last chapter of Nuka Defies Destiny. Another reason that I would look, well, the other main synergies that, synergy that I would look for with Nico Defies Destiny is Master Scald, because Master Scald is generally very strong with sagas, and Nico Defies Destiny is a saga that you can often get pretty late, and Master Scald has other synergies that I discussed earlier in Blue Light Control. So that's like something that you can kind of like plan for and set up in some of these decks. Again, I don't want this to be like the centerpiece of my deck. I don't want like trying to maximize Nico Defy's Destiny to be like my reason or the thing that's getting me into doing this. I want that to be, oh, this is a way that I was able to put some cards that tabled together into something that's greater than the sum of its parts to make my deck that's drafted around maximizing one of these like really powerful rares that I've drafted my control deck around make the rest of the deck strong and functional and able to win when I don't draw that rare. Right, so some quick notes going back to the premium premium uncommons that I mentioned where I was just, I'm not going to say what all of them do because I've already said it. So I'll just say their name and then talk about like what kinds of things it makes me think about and pay attention to and feel drawn toward when I'm drafting. So for example, Vega the Watcher is going to make me look for Fertel cards. Really obvious, but that's what's going on. Uh, theoretically, it makes me a little bit more open to control, but it's also good in aggro because it's a 2-2 flyer. But it's the kind of card that can give me enough... Uh, card advantage that I can feel like I might actually win with my control deck. <laughs> Clarion Spirit obviously is looking for cantrips and cheap spells. Plays really well in aggro or control, doesn't matter. In aggro you're going to be probably thinking more about cheap spells. In control you're going to be thinking more about cheap cantrips like revitalize and strategic planning to hold the multiverse, but going to play really well either, in either deck. Shepherd the Cosmos is looking for two drops. Doesn't necessarily have to be creatures. Plays really well with runes and stuff that uh, sometimes trade off. And then also you want to be thinking about self-mill as an additional way to turn this on uh, more reliably. Self-mill basically just means strategic planning. Uh, Giant's Amulet, generally good card, but it's going to slightly push me toward thinking about drafting a control deck. It's a little bit better there since it's more of a defensive creature than an aggressive creature, obviously, because the four or five stats are really good at breaking attackers. And obviously, Hexproof only when untapped points to you want to be blocking rather than attacking with this creature. 
Valkyrie's Sword, good finisher for the control deck, but uh, I think more than anything, Valkyrie's Sword is going to push me toward looking to generate treasures with pick to try to like make this angel faster. I've had really, really, really good experiences with casting Valkyrie's Sword to make a 6-5 Flying Vigilance creature on turn 5 or something with pick. I think that's very worth drafting toward. Avalanche Caller. Obviously, this pushes you down this whole snow path. Reasonably unlikely that it leads you into a white deck. If it does, it can open you up to playing a more control, more controlling deck, but it's going to be solid anytime you have enough snow lands. Not really a strong pressure on any given direction. I'm sure the Fallen, as I talked about, not at its best in blue-white at all, but better the more aggressive you are in blue-white or anything else. Rune Crown is going to push you toward wanting runes, obviously, and then also specifically Starnheim, Corsair, and Flyers in general. Icebind Pillar, very similar situation to Avalanche Collar. Glimpse of the Cosmos is gonna is really flexible, but obviously wants you to look for giants, which mostly means Mistwalker, but also might get you to play uh, Lajara Kin Seekers and stuff, or whatever it's called, Kin whoever. Yeah, I think that, I guess the last part of my notes that I haven't really gone over is the commons that are better in blue-white than they are anywhere else. So um, just a quick list of cards in these colors that I think are like particularly valuable when you're blue-white. A lot of this I've already touched on. Uh, Battlefield Raptor, Giant Ox, God's Hall Guardian, Doomscar Oracle, Iron Verdict, and Revitalize. Some of that's only for control, some of that's only for aggro, but all of them I think pair particularly well with blue for one reason or another, I think all of which I've touched on already. And then in blue, Bergstrider, Bind the Monster, Disdainful Stroke, Carful Harbinger, and Raven Form. The only one of those I hadn't previously mentioned is Carful Harbinger. This one is just like obviously good if you're foretelling a lot. It's uh, pretty good in the blue-white control deck. And then Gold Vein Pick I've already touched on. Those are like the commons to watch for that uh, you know you should be able to get late or later than they are good for you. Relatively late for their power to keep an eye on when you're drafting this archetype. So yeah, that's that's gonna cover basic explanation here. And um, so we're gonna turn it over to questions in a sec. Uh, but yeah, just to cover again, big, you know, high level takeaways that you definitely wanna, you know, understand and remember from this. Unless you have a bomb, try to attack with flyers, prioritize like paying attention. If you're dra if you are attacking with flyers, pay attention to the fact that against aggressive decks you're going to need some kind of like tempo plays to reliably win races. You want to specifically draft your own gold vein pick and making treasure and then having ways to take advantage of that treasure. In the control deck, you only want to do this if you have a bomb that you're drafting toward. Once you have a bomb that you're drafting toward, cards like Behold the Multiverse and Strategic Planning are really good at finding that bomb. And cards like Bind the Monster and Iron Verdict and Disdainful Stroke and even Giant Ox and God's Hall Guardian are really good at making the game go long enough, but bound in gold, obviously, making the game go long enough that you find that bomb. So it's a really good way to maximize uh, starting with a card like Starne uh, Starnheim Unleashed that will usually win the game if you can live to a late game and cast it in a late game and find it, or Doomscar. I think... Sternheim Unleashed and Doomscar are both kind of at their absolute best in blue-white, and they are absolutely reasons to draft blue-white control. You just don't, and there, there are a lot of like meaningful synergies and coherent things you can do here. You just don't want to do it without that big end game. That's going to wrap up the lecture portion. So transitioning directly to questions from chat. I'll be reviewing chat that happened while I was discussing this, but if you have any questions, please ask now, even if you've already asked before, if you feel like I haven't answered your question, I would. it would be easiest for me if you just ask it again. All right, first question is, approximately how many snow lands do you try to get per Bergstrider? Uh, it's certainly not like a, you know, just a straightforward, oh, I like two for each Bergstrider. If I have two Bergstriders, I want two. If I have, or if I have one Bergstrider, I want two. If I have two, I want four. If I want three, I, I want six. Each snow land that you want, that you have, contributes to all of your Bergstriders. It does make sense that like, oh, if I have three Bergstriders, Snowlands are gonna be more important than if I have only one Bergstrider. But like fundamentally, 
no matter how many Bergstriders you have, your odds of having a snow land on turn five don't change. And so um, you, the, the question is less how many snow lands per Bergstrider and more what odds do you need of having a snow land on the turn when you plan to cast your Bergstrider do you need to put the Bergstrider in your deck? And obviously that's going to be a function of how good the Bergstrider is when you don't have the Snowland. Because, I mean, you know, just in general, how many sources do I need to splash a card? Well, it depends on how good the card is when you splash it. And like, in this case, it's not really splashing a card because you can cast it even without your splash mana. Uh, it, it's, it's very much not oh, well, I need X Snowlands to be able to do this, and very much more, well, I need to conceptualize the power level of my Bergstrider as a function of how many Snowlands I ended up with. I would say Bergstrider is going to be, like, a good enough card that I'm going to be, like, pretty happy with it if I have, like, three Snowlands. But, like, as far as, like, what percent better, if we assume that, like, locking a creature down adds... 20% to the strength of a Bergstrider, though that's a weird way of looking at it because um, what really matters is its value over the power level of a replacement 5 drop rather than like a function of itself, kind of. This is getting complicated, but you can do the math on the probability that you have a snow land when you're casting a Bergstrider as a function of like the number of uh, like snow lands you've drafted, and then do the math on like how much better or worse is my Bergstrider. Uh, based on that probability. But ultimately, that just gets you to, and now I need to compare that, compare it to whatever my next best option is. Long story short, I would like to have four-ish Snowlands in my Bergstrider deck, <laughs> but uh, it's it's not... It's, it's, a, it's a really complicated question. It doesn't have a simple answer, really. What is the upper number of Vega you can play? So... Off the top of my head, I'd be very comfortable playing three of them. Uh, if I have like a lot of sagas, especially uh, cheap sagas, such that sticking a Vega is gonna like run away with the game and or generate so much card advantage that drawing dead Vegas won't really hurt me. Four or five? Like realistically, you're not gonna be like, oh, I'm Vega flooded, I'm gonna cut these things in your Vega deck. Just the more Vegas you have, the more you should prioritize for tail cards and I'm sure you can make it work. This next question is about Vega pulling toward multicolor in some capacity, which obviously makes sense because the more colors you have, the more foretell cards you have access to. Yeah, I, I think that the blue-white control deck is very able to splash some cards, especially some like off-color high-impact foretell cards. Like it's really good to splash Demon Bolt, Demon Bolt in a blue-white control deck especially once you're playing cards like Strategic Planning and Behold the Multiverse, playing a long game, potentially playing Pilfering Hawk. Like, you start to have a lot of card selection, a lot of ability to, like... Well, look, I often say that the, the best mana fixing is drawing more cards. And the best way to draw more cards is to play a longer game and to take advantage of additional draw steps rather than to use more card drawing spells you also end up using more card drawing spells. But the big difference in how many cards you're seeing is how long the games you're playing are. The longer a game you play is, the more likely it is that you'll eventually be able to cast your your uh, splash card. So this is why it's very unlikely that you want to splash in an aggro deck and very likely that you want to splash in a control deck. Just fundamental truth about any kind of draft format, any kind of limited format it applies to sealed just as well. So especially these like really hard control decks in blue-white, it's very, very cheap to splash a card or two. And it is the case that Vega really rewards you for playing some splash cards that let you get extra foretell. So yeah, very, very, very happy to splash a Demon Bolt or two or something like that in my uh, blue white control deck. And I, I would still consider that a blue white control deck. All right, the next question, if you're a blue white control deck, how much do you want to invest in two and three drop creatures to defend versus aggro? This is another question where I don't think there's a precise number so much as you want to make sure that you have a good plan against aggressive decks. Two and three drop creatures 
are a way to do that, but the more I'm a foretell deck, the less I want two mana creatures because the more I want to spend my turn two foretelling. The fewer two mana creatures I have and the more I'm going to be spending my mana foretelling on turn two, the more I need some of these efficient, cheap removal spells to make up that tempo. So to me, it's, there's a good chance that the optimal case for a blue light control deck is going to be to have very few, if any, uh, two and three drop creatures that I'm trying to use defensively, but to have a lot of iron verdicts and buying the monsters and card draw spells and fertile and stuff. Obviously, realistically, it's probably going to be a mix of cheap removal and two and three mana defensive creatures, but there's not like a number that I'm targeting. It's very much look holistically at how likely your deck is to get run over. C cards like God's Hall Guardian might not come down until turn four, but they do a really, really good job of stabilizing the ground once they come down. So that would meaningfully contribute to um, like making sure that my deck has adequate measures against aggressive decks, which is the way that I'm going to think about its positioning as a control deck more than specifically what's my threshold for number of two and three mana creatures I'm looking for. Um, I understand the utility of these kind of like paint by numbers guidelines, but I don't think that they're like ultimately the best way to look at it. And so I, especially with a question that precise, I don't have like a direct number I can give you. Uh, next question is, so is this archetype only really viable with some bombs or is there a backdoor into the deck? So it depends on what you're referring to with this archetype. For the most part, blue-white control is only viable with some bombs. However, a sufficient number of Vegas and Giant's Amulets and Valkyrie Swords and uh, Icebound, pill Icebound Pillars and just like good like game-winning late-game cards that you can support with a sufficient density of Behold the Multiverse and Bound in Gold and Iron Verdict. Like, if your card quality is high enough, your control deck will be able to win. But it's very, very risky to try to go into it without a bomb. Because, like, the total power level of your deck summed up is going to matter a lot more uh, when you're playing a control deck, because you're just going to draw a much larger portion of your deck, and you're going to let your opponent draw a much larger portion of their deck. And if your deck has less power than their deck, you're going to lose a vast majority of the time. So you need to make sure that your deck has, like, enough total strength in it and it's just much easier to like hit that total strength threshold if you start with a bomb. But if by this archetype you mean blue-white, well, you can just position to pivot into aggro instead if you're seeing blue and white cards, but not a bomb. Uh, what are the common, uncommon creatures that I'm really happy to put into the deck? Again, depends on whether we're talking about aggro or control, but uh, broadly, the flyers. Um, I'm pretty happy with the flyers in both of them. And then, as I mentioned, in aggro, also Bergstrider and, like, efficient two drops. And then in control, basically any kind of uh, creature with defensive stats or that offers card advantage or life gain. So that would be cards like God's Hall Guardian, Master Scald, Doomscar Oracle, um, Giant Ox, Carful Harbinger, uh, Pilfering Hawk, if I have snow. And then all the good uncommon creatures that have synergies with the plan. I'm not going to try to list all the uncommon creatures that I want to play. Next question, 17 lands has blue-white as the second worst two-color deck, uh, well behind the uh, number eight deck, which is blue-green. Um, do I think this is, in general, a bottom-tier archetype, or are people just bad at building it? I would... So I did mention that uh, I think it's relatively rare that you want to go into it, and for the control version, you need very specific, like, bombs, and for the aggressive version, you need to be seeing multiple copies of your key spells. So in both, you really need things to go right. It's not an archetype that I, like, I don't think you can successfully force blue-white, where I do think you can basically, like, successfully heavily bias toward five-color or multicolor. I think you can successfully heavily bias toward red aggro or white aggro or red-white aggro with variation or whatever. There are so many different cards that play toward those strategies that you'll find something and make it work. Whereas if you find yourself competing with someone for blue-white, your deck is just going to be garbage. Um, there's no way around it. If you're locked into blue-white and someone else is also blue-white, 
uh, the card pool is just not very deep. And you also like, because it's both, there are both a lot of bad cards in the colors that you just don't want to play in any deck. And the cards that you do want to play, a lot of them are pulling in different directions. There's there are some cards that overlap, but there are some that really don't. And that means that like once you start fighting with someone, you just like really run into spots where you're just not seeing the stuff that you need. So, um, like raw in a vacuum, like you know, access to all the cards in the set, or well, access to like I don't know, like ignoring the natural balance that happens as a result of draft if no one knows what they're doing and people just like roll dice to determine their colors or something blue white is not the color combination you want to roll um the more people like understand that blue white's bad and understand how to draft their decks and stuff the natural balancing forces of draft will lead to you you know getting some of these cards that i talked about that should be payoffs for blue white that people are overrating in other archetypes and once you start reliably getting, you know, blue-white decks with a lot of Augury Ravens and Iron Verdicts and stuff, the archetype would perform a lot better. So, um, like, in total, yes, it is relatively weak. Does that mean it's undraftable? No, not at all. You just need to, like, know that you're in an open seat and know what you're looking for. Next question is... With people taking Behold very aggressively, is it a good idea to steer toward this archetype um, already in pack one? In other words, is the payoff of being blue-white there if the best for tell card in the archetype is of uh, first pickable quality by any deck splashing blue? It's a really good question, um, and to me this is uh, one of the... So, <laughs> Behold the Multiverse is um, in a really interesting spot uh, in that... It is very well loved by uh, content creators um, discussing uh, Call Time Limited from what I've seen, at least in my circles. Um, I know that like Luis is really high on it, Ben Stark's really high on it, I'm really high on it. Um, but the numbers, honestly, on 17 lands don't quite bear that out. It, performs solidly but not among the top commons in terms of like its win rate and stuff so behold the multiverse might be just like broadly being overrated due to like um experts opinions on it which uh can get into a really long detailed argument about whether the expert opinions are more or less meaningful than the uh user results um, and getting into like why exactly it might not perform well, what people who drafted are doing wrong with it, what the fact that maybe people are doing something wrong with it means for any given listener as a drafter themselves. But uh, long story short, I would expect Behold the Multiverse to be highly contested. And that does mean that if I'm not seeing them, I'm not going to expect that I will get them in a control deck. And the result is that I'm not going to try to lean um, into a spot where I'm counting on finding them. Uh, if I have them, I can start drafting around the fact that I have them. But until I have them, I'm assuming that I'm not going to get them. Um, and that is part of what contributes to my saying that I want to bias toward aggro. And like in uh, the actual like Sky's aggro deck, I'm not convinced that Behold the Multiverse is a better card in that archetype than Bergstrider. I don't even know if it's a better card in that archetype than Mistwalker. Um, the archetype certainly doesn't need Behold the Multiverse to function the way that like, the control deck arguably does. So um, certainly take into account uh, how much you expect to have access to Behold the Multiverse when thinking about like how much to prioritize cards that count on having it, like this you know, cheap removal and stuff and generally an intent to play a grindy game. What is the role of Revitalize in blue-white decks? Uh, narrow. It, you could hypothetically play it if you were short on cards in an aggro deck to win races, but that's not what I'm going to be trying to do with it. Um, what you are trying to do with it is, first and foremost, trigger Clarion Spirit, and second after that, uh, recoup life loss to bind the monster in a control deck. Uh, outside of that, you basically shouldn't be playing it. Maybe if you have a bunch of Doomscar Oracles that you want to trigger, um, but yeah, really, 
it's like exactly oh if i like have multiple clarion spirits then like revitalize becomes a really good way to like keep triggering them all right um i believe i've answered all of the questions currently in the queue um all right sorry quick additional question uh all right we're getting a few more so um does this archetype want raven form as removal uh want this archetype can, raven form is not a good card uh luis has tweeted about this accurately uh people i i've seen a lot of players incorrectly play it in archetypes that don't have a lot of flyers and spots where like the one on flyer they give their opponent is very costly uh blue white in general is the archetype that's best at using it by a lot because um your flyers all have more than one toughness so all of them can uh, like potentially ignore this one on flyer that you've given them. It's hard for them to meaningfully attack or block with it a lot of the time. So it's like a non-embarrassing functional removal spell that you can play if you're like hard up for a functional removal spell. Not a big fan of it in the aggro deck, not a big fan of it at all, but I would totally understand or forgive playing it in control, though full disclosure, I've never done that myself. Um, Next question, is buying the monster even playable in control? Talked about this some. I believe it is. I don't have experience personally doing it, but it does feel like a really good way to turn uh, card advantage into board impact. And I believe that life gain from Doomscar Oracle and Revitalize, if you're willing to go down that path, can really help uh, mitigate the uh, damage that you take from it. That's going to wrap it up. Thank you very much, everyone, for hanging out and listening, and uh, especially to those of you in chat for participating and giving me some more questions to answer. I will uh, end this with a quest or suggestion that um, the best way that you can uh, support me and this podcast at this point, honestly, doesn't cost you anything, might even help you, is just if you have any friends who you like talking to about magic who aren't aware of or don't listen to this podcast maybe encourage them to check it out if you like it there's a good chance friends who are especially friends in a similar uh who have a similar relationship with magic to you would also like it they listen to it you can uh you know discuss things with them uh win-win and i'm really just looking to you know spread the word help the most people i can with this build exposure all that so um if you're looking to support the podcast, subscriptions on um, uh, my Twitch channel and uh, supporting the Patreon are helpful. But honestly, uh, the thing I would most ask of listeners who are appreciating it is just spread the word. That is it for me for this week. Um, I would tell you what I'll be covering next week, but that is up to the patrons. So we'll find out later. Um, thank you and goodbye, everyone.